morning. Again, we're going to continue the series, The Signs of the Times, and this message particularly this week and most likely next week also will be very informative, um, a little different than I typically preach, more evangelistic, but again, I, I want to preface this series each week with the heartbeat of a pastor I have no intention again I want to share this with you I have no intention to preach to you a a clever message or 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 no desire to try and give you some wow revelation I just want to lay the truth the facts out the signs of the times we're living in I'm not even trying to convince you or persuade you I'm believing the Holy Spirit to show you the reality of the days, the hour that we're living in now, I'm praying that God would be the one to convince you and convict you and not me. So I pray if you, if you don't like what's being preached, do your own research, study it. I believe that God has always been faithful to give signs. So as I, uh, again, get into this, I want to lay a foundation this morning. God always gives signs. This isn't new, and I don't want to, to I, I'm not one of these guys that's, I hate this term, but for lack of a better term, hyper-spiritual. There are some folks that are looking for signs in everything, and I don't believe in that. I don't believe that everything has a, has a sign behind it. I believe God uses everything. But God is definitely a God that will give signs in the heaven and signs on the earth. How many of you know that He's coming back? Amen. How many of you believe He's coming back? Oh, He's coming back, amen. Whether you believe it or not, whether you know it or not, He is coming back. And there are signs in the heavens today declaring the soon coming King. There are signs on the earth today declaring the soon coming King. When I say soon, I'm not using that loosely. I'm telling you, we are living in the last days. If you would have asked me even eight years ago, I've only been pastoring here a little over seven. You'd ask me eight years ago, I didn't think I'd see the Lord come back in my lifetime. I believed He was coming back. But I'm telling you, as I've dug more in the Word, as I've gotten more familiar with Scripture, there is no reason prophetically why He can't come this hour. I believe today I would be kidding myself. I would be ignorant and naive to tell you anything other than the birth pangs have begun. I shared with you on week one how the signs that Jesus told His disciples, they asked Him, tell us when will it happen? We all want to know when it will happen. He said, okay, nobody knows. And you won't know either. But I'll tell you the signs to look for. I don't have to be familiar with the road that I'm traveling on as long as they'll post signs. I'll know where the curve is coming. I'll know when the stop sign is approaching me. I'll know when the bridge is out ahead. I'll know when there's icy conditions, all based on the signs. Signs do not save. Signs do not condemn. Signs are message boards. They are an opportunity for God to give a message to people. told you the other week, the the golden arches, that's a sign, right? It doesn't condemn, quite the contrary. It's there to let you know they've got good hamburgers inside. If you like McDonald's. They put those signs and those big golden arches way above the tree line on the interstate. You want to know why? Because they want to make sure that you don't miss it. They want to make sure if you drive past it's because you chose to ignore the sign. God puts signs on the earth and God puts signs in the heavens. And all the way back, and again, I, I just want to lay this foundation because I don't want you to think that I'm trying to, to, to preach some super spiritual stuff to you and some hocus pocus. I don't believe in that, but I'm telling you the word of God is true. God will always give you a word, and then God will give you signs. We go all the way back to the beginning of creation, and you'll hear me reference Noah almost every week, if not every week. Why? Because God warned us that in the last days, it'll be just like it was in the day of Noah. Signs came. From the heavens and signs were on the earth, but men chose to ignore them. People presumed they had tomorrow. People lived as though they had nothing to worry about. The Bible says they were marrying and giving to marriage. They were eating and drinking. In other words, just living life, just presuming that tomorrow will come, just assuming that they've got someday. There are many folks in the church this morning and many, no doubt, in my mind, in this church this morning who are still relying on that hope of someday. Hey, I want to go to heaven. I want to serve God, but I can't right now because my job, my career, because I'm in school, all this stuff, it would make me unpopular, make me uncool. Right now, I'm I'm just enjoying life, but someday. Can I be real with you? I'm going to be real with you. How about that? 
You don't have a promise of tomorrow. You don't have the security in someday. Got word this morning that one in our own church lost a family member this morning. You don't have a promise of tomorrow. Your loved ones don't have a promise of tomorrow. Why don't you live today like today is the last day? Why don't you live today as though he could come back for you? If he doesn't come back before you die, then you'll die before he comes back. Either way, you had better be ready to meet the maker. Amen? I'm telling you, he's coming back. In the beginning, God sent a word. He said judgment was coming, but a way of salvation is being made. He sent then a preacher to preach that word, and his name was Noah. Noah preached that word, and Noah, Noah worked and labored for the Lord, building an ark. And God sent the word, sent the messenger, and then began to send the signs. I told you the signs on the earth were, were no doubt the animals that would have come as a, as a, a word of, of warning, as a, a word of opening your eyes, a word of awakening. A word of judgment as much as salvation because with every sign God is saying, look, this is going to come back to be a sign of judgment. If you don't repent, it's not going to be one of those things where you can stand up before the Lord and say, I didn't know. You did. You did know. You definitely knew. The signs were there. You drove past that McDonald's sign, not because you didn't see it, but because you chose to ignore it. When the animals came out of hiding and all of them began to make their way. And again, I, I say to you, I believe that was a, a, a several month process at a minimum. Daily, animals coming from all over the globe to make it to this one way of salvation. And that was an act of grace for everyone that came through the village. This was a sign pointing to salvation. A sign trying to wake up the world. We got the word and the word's being preached and, and the word in and of itself is a sign. This big giant boat is a sign in the earth. And the specific thing God said to look for would be the rain. Water from heaven, something you've never seen, but it would be a sign. And it began to happen. And I personally believe that every man, woman, and child had hundreds or thousands of those water drops fall and literally hit them on the head. I don't believe there was one individual that was unaffected. I don't believe there was one individual that could then stand before the Lord and say, I didn't know. You did know. You saw the signs on the earth, and as if that weren't enough, I gave you signs from the heaven. I made sure that X number of raindrops hit you on the head. I'm not worried about what your neighbor saw or didn't see. I'm not worried about what they did or didn't do. I'm talking to you and this is going to be the judgment of God when we stand before. That I sent you signs of hope. I sent you signs of grace. I was loving, long-suffering. I was patient. And you saw all these signs, but you chose to ignore them. Presuming on tomorrow. God's always used signs. Now listen. Just like it was with the birth of Christ, the coming of the Savior the first time, there were signs that he gave to look for, was there not? God is consistent to his word. This is what I'm trying to tell you. But first, there comes a word. This morning, I, I want us to look at the scripture in Isaiah chapter 9. I preached on this last week. Isaiah chapter 9. Begin with verse 6. I'm sorry, begin with verse 8. As we get into this, I, I want to give credit to Messianic Rabbi Khan, Jonathan Khan. He wrote the book, The Harbinger. And God's given him some tremendous insight into this scripture, and I do personally subscribe to that. I don't, I don't preach things lightly to you. I do my best to to be a diligent steward and to do my research and I don't believe everything that I hear my mind just doesn't work that way I have to look it up I've got to find out but I do subscribe very sincerely to the things that God has revealed to him I believe we are living in the last days Isaiah chapter 9 begin with verse 8 the Lord sent a word into Jacob and it hath lighted upon Israel and all the people shall know even Ephraim and the inhabitants of Samaria that say in the pride and stoutness of heart, the bricks are fallen down, but we will build with hewn stone, cut stone. And the sycamores are cut down, but we will change them into cedars or replace them with cedars. Therefore the Lord shall set up the adversaries of resin against him and join his enemies together, the Syrians before and the Philistines behind. And they shall devour Israel with open mouth. 
For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. What he's saying there is that I've come to correct you, but because you wouldn't repent, there's still correction outstretched. There's still judgment waiting to be fall upon you. Chapter 10, verse 5 and 6. God says, O Assyrian, the rod of my anger and the staff in their hand is my indignation. I will send him against a hypocritical nation and against the people of my wrath will I give him a charge to take the spoil and to take the prey and to tread them down like the mire of the streets. I told you first comes a word before any signs. First comes a word. Isaiah foretold this word. God had already given you and I message. First comes the word, then the signs. And I believe that this is a prophetic word for us today. I, I want to be clear with you. If you give me a couple weeks, I'll break this down even more. I believe that the United States of America is a divinely planted land, much like the nation of Israel. I believe that the Jews are a covenant people with God. We are not in that same covenant, but we are a nation that was built and established just like the nation of Israel. We are a divinely planted nation for the cause of Christianity and nothing more. And apart from that, we have no purpose for existing. God planted us for that purpose. I believe that. Give me a couple weeks and I, I, will, I will preach and explain it to you in such a way that I hope you understand biblically. I believe that this is a prophetic word, not just an Old Testament word for an, a, an Israelite nation, but for the United States of America. Now listen to me. I, I, I've got to lay a foundation. God never gives generic prophetic words. Hey, I'm coming. That's generic. He says, I'm coming. And as a matter of fact, let me tell you the signs to look for. When his disciples asked to, to know when, he said, I won't tell you that, but I will tell you the sign. I, I'm not going to blindside you. I want to be specific and detailed. This is the way that God works. He said, Pastor Mark, I don't know. Well, let's just back up. When, when, let me back up in this scripture before we get started. Isaiah just finished talking about this famous Christmas scripture. Unto us a, a child is given. Isaiah is talking about this. He's talking about the coming of a deliverer. But before the deliverer comes, there will come judgment. Why does judgment come? Because God's trying to punish people just for their wicked sins? No. Because God's trying to turn a wicked people back to Him so that He might save them. Amen. He is coming back. But God knows if I come back now that many, many even in the church will not be ready. Many just like in the days of Noah. Oh, they've seen the signs. The reason God didn't come on day one, He could have just wiped the earth out. He could have said, Noah, build the, build the boat as soon as it's ready, I'm coming. But because He was patient, long-suffering... Because he so loved the world, even though they were sinners, even though they were evil. He loved them so much, he did not expedite his coming. But he continually sent signs so that maybe he might wake them up. Why did your mom and dad, if you, I told them in the first service, maybe you didn't get spanked. I got spanked and I got whooped. There was a difference and I knew it. But I got punished. I deserved it. I'm not knocking that at all. I think it was wonderful. I didn't then. Now, my parents, now, now you're, they're smart enough. They were smart enough to know one day this boy's going to grow up. So they could have approached this whole discipline thing like this. You know, just, just let him do whatever he wants to do. One day he'll get old and he'll have to deal with the consequences. And he'll grow up and he'll, he'll have to be his own man. That's true. Why didn't he do that, knowing that I was going to grow up? Just because he liked it? No, because he loved me. And he said, if, if I wait until then, it will have been too late. You will have destroyed your own life. So the reason I didn't wait till then, I give you punishment now out of love. The same reason that God corrects us now rather than waiting till He shows up. Why don't you just wait until you come back and then deal with us all? Out of love, I discipline and chastise those that I love because if I wait till then, you'll die. You will have destroyed your own life. God gives specific details to His prophecy. When He talked about the coming of the Savior, the birth of Jesus, all the way back to Isaiah. God didn't just say, I'm going to send a boy into the world. He got very specific and detailed in his prophecy. Isaiah would foretell that he would be born of a virgin. It would be told that he would be from Bethlehem. 
It would be foretold that he would be sold for 30 pieces of silver. That's interesting. It would be foretold that he would be crucified. I mean, this is pretty specific, isn't it? So these will be the signs so, so that somebody won't just pop up like we see in the last days and say that I am the Christ. Well, let me see if you fit all the signs. If you don't fit the signs, you cannot be the Christ. But all these very specific details, all these very specific prophecies to the point that they even said that he would come riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. Well, if he's the king of kings and the Lord of lords, why not a horse and display his power and his might? It would be foretold that he would be crucified. It would be foretold that not a bone on his body would be broken. And that's interesting in and of itself. I was sharing with them in the first service. It's a miracle that he died in a matter of hours on the cross. You didn't die that quickly on the cross. It was a form of Roman torture designed to make you suffer for days. What ended up killing people on the cross was asphyxiation or suffocation. When you were no longer strong enough to push yourself up to allow your lungs to expand, you just simply suffocated out of weakness. Your, your muscles giving out. You would dehydrate up there and your, your muscles would contract and eventually it would kill you. This is why you hear of a mercy seat different than the mercy seat on the ark that put that little wedge right at the, at the butt of the victim. And what that was, it was a mercy seat. But really all that did is prolong the suffering. Because now he didn't have to push himself up as far he could kind of rest on that. No one died. I'm saying all that to say no one died in hours on the cross. But because, listen to me, but because the Sabbath was coming, they had to get these people to satisfy Jewish custom, had to get these people off the cross in a hurry. Now these Romans came by to break the legs of the victims because when their legs are broken, they can't push up and they'll die very quickly. So they come by and they, now, just think about this for a moment. They could care less about this man Christ. If I were a Roman guard in that day, I would dare not even look to see if he's dead or alive. I could care less. Let me whack somebody with this club and break their legs. They, they get great joy and satisfaction. These are criminals. They took pleasure in this. These were trained killers. It wasn't like the guy pushing the button in the electric chair that maybe does this once in all of his life or a couple times at most. I'm telling you, these men did this on a day-in, day-out basis. This is what they did for a living. They were trained assassins. This is the culture of the day and time which our Christ came into the world. So when they come and they hit the legs of the first thief and, and hit the legs of the second thief because they're still alive, they get to the Christ and I can't even wrap my brain. Why would they hold the club back? Why would they even look to see if he's alive or dead? But they did. They did. Why? Because it had to fulfill prophecy. If it's truly the Messiah, he cannot have a leg broken. But the Romans could care less. I don't even know if they know that scripture. So they get to the Christ and, and the same thing that he told his disciples. No man has the power to take my life, but I give it. It's interesting that on the cross he said it is finished and gave up the ghost. He had the power of life and death. He gave it up when the time came. He declared it's finished and, and gave up the ghost. When the Romans come to him and they would have broke his leg, but because of prophecy they could not, God would hold back the club and they'd look and inspect the man and say he's dead. And, and one of them had the bright idea, well maybe he's not. Then why not just go ahead and break his legs and be done with it anyway? You understand the rationale? But instead, one takes a spear. Instead of breaking legs, one takes a spear and runs it into his side. You want to know why? Because Isaiah had foretold he would be pierced for our iniquity. God is very specific. And that was in order that we might be grafted in. So in the first service, this is, this is the beauty of that grafting process. Unless the bark is peeled off the side of the living vine or the living tree, the branch will lay there dead. It cannot get life to it. Where the branch was broken off, in order for it to be grafted in, the bark, the side has to be opened up of the living vine so that the blood, the sap can flow from it and into the brokenness of the other and begin to give it life. That's the, the process. Oh, see, the Bible had already said that we would be adopted or grafted in. It's more than just an adoption process. You can do that on paper. But the grafting process requires blood. Oh, glory. Hallelujah. And by His blood, we are strayed. Amen. By His stripes, we are healed. He was pierced for our iniquity. All these things very specific. God wasn't general in that. Are you with me? Now listen to me. 
I want you to keep that in mind because as Isaiah is laying this scripture out, it, if, if what I'm preaching to you this morning is truly prophetic for this day and time, then every detail in the prophecy must be fulfilled or this is not a prophetic word from God. Is that you, you with me? If Jesus Christ failed to meet just one of those check boxes, then he could not be the Messiah. We would look for another. This is where Isaiah talks about the coming Savior, but before the Savior there must come judgment so that God might turn the people from their wicked ways back to Him. Now understand the, the context of this scripture. Israel now is a divided nation. Follow with me. I'm laying the foundation and we'll get into this. Israel is a divided nation, a divided kingdom. We've got the, the northern tribes and the southern tribes. The northern tribes had begun to turn their back on God. Listen to me. Follow closely. It matters. The northern tribe, wait, wait, let me back up. The nation of Israel, God's people, is now two nations. One people, two nations. I believe the United States of America is that second nation prophetically today. One people, two nations. The northern kingdom had begun to turn their back on God. Hey, they're all God's people, but they're no longer worshiping God like they should. They've begun to be idolatrous, pagan worshipers. They still love the Lord, still say they're His people, but it's even gotten to the point where not only have they turned their back on God, but they have begun to turn their back on their own brethren in Judah and attack their own. This is why he's saying that he'll turn their enemies. And, and, and where he talks about resin, this is the, the, the king's little negotiation deal with, a, with a, a foreign nation, the Assyrians actually. Here's the day and time that we're living in. I believe that we are a nation that was divinely planted by God. We are of that same one nation, spiritual Israel. But we are a nation divided. We are over here in the United States of America, and Israel has their little plot of land. We are a nation divided. We are the now, now the Jews, while they've never accepted Christ, they are not nearly as adulterous and idolatry centered as we are they're still a very holy people and they really are we on the other hand we are so far removed from God and we don't even know it we call things godly that are so pagan so evil so wicked we've turned our back on God and we are very very close to, we've begun to turn our back on our brethren in Israel and listen to me very closely I'm not the only one preaching this, but I'm telling you, the moment we withdraw from Israel, it will be a very, very quick judgment from God. This is, this, this is the context in which we read this scripture. So, so keep all this in mind. If this is a prophetic word from God for this nation, then this word must be kept prophetically. Every box must be checked. Are you with me? It's just going to be informative this morning. The very first sign that this word in Isaiah is true for you and I was the breach. There is something that we call the, the, the doctrine of the hedge. We get that scripturally from the book of Job. We see that the devil comes to, to, to the Lord and he says, you know, that he's considered Job. But the reason he can't attack him, he says, is because you have a hedge about him. I can't get in. There's nothing I can do. You have hedged him all about. Listen to me. The very moment that the enemy was able to breach the head should have been an alarm for the world. At least an alarm for this nation to say, if God be forced then how? How can the enemy get in? Something must be wrong. The very first sign was the hedge was breached. If we back up in this chapter a little bit, and again this morning is going to be very informative, so follow with me. Take notes if you want. The breach in the hedge. At the beginning of this chapter, God makes mention of light affliction. First came a light affliction. I told you last week, light affliction is what my father used to do if I was across the room. I didn't always get spanked. Most of the time I required that extra level. I, I had a hard head. But occasionally my dad would look, and you know, I, there was a look. There, 
most of the time I got that look, that look was more than enough because I knew what was behind that look was serious business. It was going to get worse from there, amen? Most of the time, the only reason I got that look is because he was too far away to reach me at that time. But there was definitely a look. Now, if I didn't heed that look because there were a few times, guess what came? Something worse. It continued. It began to heighten. That was light affliction when he would give me that look. That was light affliction. When he would raise his voice, that was light affliction. When I was a little child, raising the voice would be enough to make me cry. I felt the punishment just of the raised voice. You understand? It was light affliction. didn't have to lay a hand on me to get me to repent. To not do what I was doing, right? God speaks of a light affliction. Now we know 9-11, I'm going to get into that, but do you remember what happened in 1993 to the World Trade Centers? Do you even remember? It was bombed in 93. You want to know which group bombed them in 1993? Al-Qaeda. Put that, this is Time Magazine. The search for the tower bomber. This was light affliction. If, if I remember correctly from my study, I think five people died in that. And I'm not making it light. I told them in the first service, if one of those five had been one of my people, it wouldn't have mattered whether it was a thousand or only two. So I'm not taking it light, but that was nothing compared to what would happen on 9-11. This was light affliction. Our enemies breached the hedge is what I'm getting, but the alarms didn't sound. Nobody seemed to hear. Nobody seemed to care. Oh, we'll go get those guys. Well, if we back up and we say, wait a minute, if we're truly a nation that is divinely planted and protected by God, then it is impossible. Listen to me. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. It's not a, a physical thing. It's a spiritual thing. Spiritually, the hedge must have been breached. If God be for us, then who can be against us? Lord, we, we must have done something to knock a hole in the wall. But nobody questions that. This was, this was the first breach. So we have seven and a half years that go by. The cycle of earthly completion. God said, I've given you a whole season to repent. But you didn't, so my hand is still outstretched. So the breach. We don't turn back to God. We keep on stubborn, hard-headed. So the events of 9-11 would later occur. Folks, I don't understand how we miss the signs. I think we're just such a prideful, arrogant nation, much like the nation of Israel then. We're strong. See, the northern kingdom had more resources, more people. They were stronger as a nation than the southern kingdom. But they were not strong enough to oppose God. We didn't repent. Psalms 33 and 12 says. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Let me back up and explain something to you. This doctrine of the hedge if you will. This nation. You go back and do your own history. You can search this for yourself. Again, I'm not trying to do all the homework for you. I want you to know the fact. This United States of America broke off from England so that we could be free to worship Jesus Christ and Him alone. He is the foundation. He is the reason that we existed. God took, listen to me, God took this little group of people. And if you think about this, all of them didn't make it on the ship. Many would have died on the ship trying to get here. Disease would have run rampant. When they get to this, this, this new land, they don't have fortresses. They don't have armies yet. They're just a, a, a small group of people, really. A very small group of people with very limited resources. They don't even have houses yet. They don't have farms. They don't have anything to eat. It's not like they walk here and, and they can just go down to the grocery store and get what they need in the lumber yard and buy the supplies they need. They have nothing, absolutely nothing. And, and England is right on their heels. And yet somehow or another, God takes this little group of people that doesn't have an army, doesn't have the... the, the Weapons or the technology and the stuff that they need to survive in that day. And somehow God divinely protects them. Even from England. Even from those more fortified nations. God protects them. 
It's amazing that they even landed here, but somehow they did. I believe this was a land of promise. When you look at this United States on a map, doesn't, you, doesn't it make you scratch your head and say, how did they not know this place was here? They knew that there were little islands out in the Caribbean and pirates would go there to put treasure. They knew those little places, but this big, huge mass of land. Could it, could it be that God had laid aside this little piece of dirt that we call the United States of America to plant His vineyard one day? What's the vineyard? It's not the vine. Jesus said He was the vine. The vineyard is simply the place that the vine will be planted. Israel thought themselves to be the vine. And Jesus said, no, I'm the true vine. And I'll give the vineyard to another one day. I believe the United States is that other. I believe that we were a divinely planted and appointed land. And God from the very inception has divinely protected this place. Throughout all the world, listen, from, from non-existence to only 200 years, we rise to the world superpower. Now, now, militarily, I want to explain to you what would begin to happen. It's happened all throughout history long before America was here. The nation that is the strongest, when they get wind that another nation is rising to power, usually very quickly they come to attack them because they don't want to be weaker. So the nation that's in power usually has to rule and dominate by force. This goes all the way back to the beginning. Whether it was Rome or Greece in power at the time, nations always begin to attack another nation as it's rising. They don't want to wait until they get stronger or more equipped to fight back. They want to dominate then. What I'm getting at is why in the world did this nation survive? Because God had His hand on it. So if... If, if all that is true, then in 2000, I mean in 1993, we should have scratched our head and said, wait a minute, something's wrong. I told him in the first service, if you came home today and you realized you were missing jewelry, you realized you were missing money out of your safe, Everything looked to be intact, just some things were gone. And you came and you looked back at the front door and you realized that it had been pried open and there was, there were scars and there was damage on the front door where somebody had been in. But they closed everything back up. Would you say, well, I guess they got everything they want. I mean, I'm not worried about it. You're going to take it very seriously and you're going to, you're going to begin to fix the breach. Change the locks. Add different levels of security, right? You're going to acknowledge that somebody came in. What I'm getting at, this is what America did in 93. We looked at the damage and said, well, it won't get any worse than this. This is as bad as it's going to get. That's what we did. We made no acknowledgement that an enemy had come in. We just stood in defiance rather than acknowledge that the sovereignty of God. Somehow people got past the gate that is our Lord and Savior. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord or whose Lord is God. Somehow they got past that door. We see the scarring on the door. We see the bomb at the trade center. But we say, well, they, they, that's all they're going to do. And we dismissed it. Which set us up, that light affliction, which set us up for more. Right? The second sign was the, the word itself that was proclaimed. I told you before any of these signs comes a word. God had already given us this word in Isaiah, so it came before, but it comes again immediately after to let you know this is the sign. I told you the bridge was out ahead, but you passed that sign, so I'm sticking another one up in bright neon letters, putting it right in front of the road where you've literally got to plow through it to miss it. Play this video. This is Tom Daschle on the day after 9-11. Hearing no objection, the resolution is before the Senate. Mr. President. Your leader. It is with pain, sorrow, anger, and resolve that I stand before this Senate a symbol for 212 years of the strength of our democracy and say that America will emerge from this tragedy as we have emerged from all adversity, united and strong. The America in which we woke today is far different from the one in which we woke yesterday. This morning, 
as our rescue workers and medical personnel continue their heroic work, we begin to truly understand the enormity of what happened. My heart aches for the people of New York, our men and women serving at the Pentagon, the passengers and crew of the four hijacked aircraft, and for their families and friends. These attacks were an assault on our people and on our freedom. They aimed at the heart of the American community and the symbols and structures of our economic and military strength. As an American, as an elected representative, I am outraged as a husband and a father. I am pained beyond words. Last night, we sent a message to the world that even in the face of such cowardly and heinous acts, the doors of democracy will not close. This joint resolution we lay down today condemns yesterday's attacks, expresses our sympathy for the victims and our support for the president as our commander in chief. The world should know that the members of both parties in both houses stand united in this. The full resources of our government will be brought to bear in aiding the search and rescue and in hunting down those responsible and those who may have aided or harbored them. Nothing. Nothing can replace the losses of those that have suffered. I know that there is only the smallest measure of inspiration that can be taken from this devastation. But there is a passage in the Bible from Isaiah that I think speaks to all of us at times like this. The bricks have fallen down but we will rebuild with dressed stone. The fig trees have been felled, but we will replace them with cedars. That is what we will do. We will rebuild and we will recover. The people of America will stand strong together because the people of America have always stood together. And those of us privileged to serve this great nation will stand with you. God bless the people of America. I yield the floor. One of the first things we should commit to as a country with federal help that underscores our nation's purpose is to rebuild the towers of the World Trade Center and to show the world that we are not afraid we will rebuild the World Trade Centers to show the world that we are not afraid, but we are defiant. That's a key word because Tom Daschle brings this word out. And, and if you heard what he said, he said, goes through all this stuff. He says that, that it was an attack against the people, our strength, our military force. Let me ask you the question, from where came the attack? Whose hand was the rod in? God's hand. God said, I'll use the Assyrians as the rod of my correction. So the Assyrians were not the enemy. This is, I told them in the first service, this is the equivalent whenever I, I got spanked as a child. We had to break switches off sometimes. That's the equivalent of mom using that switch and me, me and my brother making an, a, an alliance together and saying, we will defy the switches. Well, the switch isn't the problem. The switch is just a tool. The one that we're actually defying is not the weapon, is not the rod of correction. It's the one holding it. And who is the one holding it? It's God. And God made this clear. 
First, he gave the word. The word was this, that I will use your enemies, this pagan nation, this unbelieving nation, I will use them as the rod of my correction. When Tom Daschle gets up and he makes that statement, he says, at times like this, you can only find just the smallest glimpse of hope or, or whatever he said, comfort. There's nothing comforting or, or hopeful about this word. This is a, a word of defiance. This is where you're looking at God. This is because God is the one that allowed the enemy to come in. God is using the enemy to wake up a nation. This is our nation then standing and saying, You have attacked our military force. You have attacked our pride. You have attacked our strength. Who? Who? Not the Assyrians, but God. So when we declare that we will build God, you can tear it down, but we'll make it stronger. Says the bricks have fallen, but we'll build again with hewn stone or quarried stone, cut stone. The sycamore, when he said fig, it's the same thing. The sycamore fig, fig sycamore tree, the sycamore fig. It's the same thing. The sycamores have fallen, but we will replace them with cedar. Now, this is, this is less than 24 hours after this has happened. He has no idea. Now, the Bible is pretty big. Most of you haven't read it from one cover to the other cover. There are so many scriptures in there that he could have picked and found words of consolation and comfort. But Isaiah 9 and 10 is the one that he picks. Could it, could it be that this was God again giving the word? Because before the signs could come, the word must be given so that you would know what the signs look for and what they look like. Now, if what I'm preaching to you this morning is a prophetic word from God for this nation, then every letter of the prophecy must be fulfilled. Just like with God's very specific. So he says, the Assyrians will be my rod of correction. Let me tell you another sign that God gave. The terrorists themselves were a sign. Al-Qaeda. Do, do you know where they're from? From the same part of the globe. Now the globe's pretty large too. And you got a very, very tiny little spot in the Middle East. But ancient Assyria was from modern day Iraq. In the same place that Al-Qaeda was hiding in and all this terrorist activity was going on. If, if this is a prophetic word for us today, then it has to be fulfilled to the letter. God said, he said, I'll, I'll use the Assyrians as the rod of my correction. Oh, oh, Assyria, the rod of my anger, the staff in their hand is my indignation. I will send them against a hypocritical nation. Are we not a hypocritical nation? Amen. On the... Hours and days, weeks after 9-11, we see everybody singing, God bless America. Even at the end of Tom Daschle's, God bless America. Come on, really? And then they'll go back to business as usual, pushing the agenda of same-sex marriage, pushing the agenda of homosexuality, pushing the agenda that God is not welcome in their meetings. What irony, what hypocrisy that they'll sing God bless America, stand beside her and guide her out on the steps but won't let him in the building when they go back to meet. He cannot be welcome there. I'm just telling you what the reality is. God says, I'll send them against a hypocritical nation. He said, therefore, the Lord will set up adversaries of resin against him and join his enemies together. The Syrians before and the Philistines behind. God saying, the Assyrians... Let me tell you something about the Assyrians. I'm going to read this. I'm quoting it. The Assyrians were among the very first users of the horse-driven war chariots. They invented siege and torture machines and things like the battering rams. The whole population whom the Assyrians would besiege would be massacred and the human heads piled outside the city walls. Most people execute any number of ways, but beheading is very exclusive to a small minority of people, just FYI. We're so far technologically and advanced in weaponry, and yet there is a small group of people today that are still beheading people, and the media is having a field day with it. I'm, I'm just saying, these are the days and the times that we're living in. These are signs of the times. The Assyrians were doing this. They would massacre a city, the whole city, and they would take 
decapitate people and pile the heads outside the city as a sign. Can you imagine if you were just going past that city and you saw a pile of heads, hundreds, maybe thousands of heads piled up outside the city wall? Wouldn't that invoke fear and terror in your heart? Listen, the Assyrians, quote, the Assyrians used tactics meant to inspire fear, to prevent captured kingdoms from revolting, to reduce the number of battles that they would have to fight, to force the surrender of of cities. Psychological warfare became state policy, and it was designed to spread awesome terror over all the land. They would write, the kings would write, and leaders would write, etched into the walls of their palaces, into caves, and into their worship centers. They would write and inscript, Images of this. So that any nation that they would come across would be terrorized. Uh, One commentator went on so far as to say that they were the inventors of terror attacks. Isn't that interesting? It could be coincidence. But God said the Assyrians. I'll use the Assyrians. Let me tell you who attacked it. Have you heard of ISIS? I know that's not. It was Al-Qaeda that attacked. But Al-Qaeda gave birth to ISIS. Who was Al-Qaeda now has become ISIS. Do you even know what ISIS stands for? ISIS and ISIL are one and the same. It stands for Islamic State of Iraq and Syria. So, Assyria was from what is now modern day Iraq. And God says, and I'll even join your enemies together. Them and the... The Syrians. I mean, now, if if what I'm sharing with you this morning is a prophetic word from God for us today, then every prophetic word in here must be checked off. Are you with me? And God says, I'll put the Assyrians and the Syrians together. I'll put Iraq and Syria together to attack you. So now we have this attack again. Now, let's go back. Their war for them, it is a holy war, it is jihad. But I point out to you the reality is we are not the only non-Islam union. We are not the only nation that are infidels according to their beliefs. What I wonder is why in the world would they choose to attack us? Surely there are weaker nations. Surely there are better targets. Why not just pick on the United Kingdom? Why not just pick on some of the countries in Europe first? Could it be that we are... The chosen nation like I told you? Could it be that they're not the instigators? Could it be that really God is sovereign? And they're just a pawn in His hand. They are just the rod of His correction for this nation. See, He didn't raise up England. And He didn't raise up Germany. And He didn't raise up the Soviet Union. He didn't raise up Asia to be this Christian nation. But this country, go back, do your own history. I'm telling you, it was for no other reason than for the advancement of the Christian faith to the point our leaders, our political leaders, our national leaders of that day originally had to declare their faith in Jesus Christ or they were not qualified as candidates to be national leaders. Oh, how far we have come. That our president has gotten up and declared to the world. Our president has declared whatever we once were, we are no longer a Christian nation. And the church didn't rise up. We get in here and we gasp for air. But he said this publicly more than once. It's been declared to the world. He told the world. And he is the voice of the nation. If he were not our voice, then we should have stood up loud and proud and said, You say what you want, but you don't speak for us. But we remained in silence and allowed him to be the speaker for the nation. Tom Daschle said, he said, let the world know that both the House and the Senate are unified in this. In other words, he's saying, let the world know that the United States speaks collectively, that I speak for the nation, that we will rebuild. The bricks have fallen, but we will rebuild with hewn stone, quarried stone. We'll build it bigger and better, stronger than it ever was. Though the cedars have come down, though the the sycamores come down, we will replant cedars in their place. This just hours after the destruction, he has no idea what's taking place. He really doesn't know the, the depth of the destruction at this point. Nobody has had time to know. So the The signs continue. So the terrorists themselves are one of the signs. It is a prophetic sign. God said, this is, I'm fulfilling it in front of your face. The next sign would be the fact that the bricks have fallen. Put that screen of destruction up there, the rubble. 
we looked at that. I mean, that's, that's a no-brainer, right? But the crazy thing is, let's go back to this hedge of protection. The crazy thing is, some of the world's superpowers dare not try and attack because we seem so invincible, so strong. They sit back and, and, and we make threats one to another, but we dare not attack. And no one dared attack the United States of America. We think ourselves so strong, and this is what God was showing us. I don't need a nation to rise up. I don't need a great military force. I can use just a handful, less than a handful of people to bring this great and mighty prideful nation to its knees. A handful of people with no weapons. No weapons. Could you ever have dreamed it? Would it, would it have even sunk into your mind that there was a possibility that this great nation could come crumbling down to her knees by a few individuals? If I had told you this before 2001 said one day, God will use a handful of people, no more than a handful of people, to bring this nation to her knees with no military force. You said, nah, that's crazy. Can't have, we, are, we are the United States of America in our pride. And that was the problem with the northern kingdom of Israel in their pride and their arrogance. They said in their hearts, we will rebuild God. We will defy you. You cannot correct us. And then we proclaimed it over our nation. Not just him. It was said other times as well. But this one is the most prophetic in my opinion. The fact that he's saying this less than 24 hours. The bricks have fallen. Yes, indeed, they have fallen. He says, but we will rebuild. The next sign is the rebuilding. And I didn't realize this. Put that picture up. I did not realize last week when I preached that Monday morning, I preached this, this text Sunday. Somebody messaged me Monday and said, Pastor, the World Trade Center opened up today. I said, really? We will rebuild. He didn't say we're going to start rebuilding. We will, we will finish it. We will rebuild. This is another sign. The fact that it was rebuilt when I started this series, I, I didn't think I'd be able to, to tell you this one was complete yet. I would tell you it was going to be a sign to look for. It was already in progress. I, I safely assumed we were going to get there. I didn't know Sunday to Monday. Check. Another sign was the sign of stone. It says, the bricks have fallen, but we will rebuild with hewn stone, cut stone, quarried stone. And, and if you go to Israel today, you'll see that, that some of these where they built the temple and the walls of Jerusalem, they used quarried stone. Some of these things are 20 and maybe even 60 tons. It's incredible because they didn't have cranes and stuff. It's still a, a, a marvel to modern science, trying to figure out how they accomplished this great feat, just like the pyramids. These are quarried stones, so they don't just fall apart like brick. Interesting thing. There was a 20-ton cornerstone that was dedicated on July 4th, 2004. Play, play that video. I, I don't. I, I want you to see. New York, a granite cornerstone was put in place where the twin towers once stood. Not enough victims' families were on hand for the groundbreaking ceremony for what will be the Freedom Tower. In a place filled with memories of horror, this Independence Day marked a new beginning to fill the aching void left when the World Trade Center towers went down. Today, we build. Freedom Tower. With the governors of New York and New Jersey and the mayor of the city officiating, a 20-ton granite cornerstone was unveiled, the first step towards construction of an office tower with a symbolically patriotic height, 1,776 feet. It will anchor the site that's supposed to eventually include a transportation center, museum, hotel, office buildings, and a
from God, then every, every letter of this prophecy must come to pass. Before it was built, they, they must quarry a stone. This thing came out of the Adirondack Mountains there in New York. 20 tons, and they lay it to build upon it. Hewn stone, cut stone, quarried stone. They don't really need this. They're going to build a steel building. They don't use, we're not living 2,000 years ago. Nobody lays a foundation with hewn stone anymore. Do you realize that? No, other than a symbolic act. And here's the thing. I'm pre- the signs of the times. You realize signs are never hidden. We don't put a sign on the side of the road behind all the trees hoping that you'll miss it. You never do that with a sign, do you? You make sure that it's highly visible. That's the purpose of a sign. And every one of these God puts on great display to make sure the world sees it. Just like the drops of rain. You will not stand before the Lord one day and say, I didn't know. Sure you did. You ignored the sign. You saw them. You ignored them. So they make a big deal out of this. And it's ironic to me. I don't really think it's irony. But on the 4th of July, they bring this. The day that we declared our independence from England. But I believe spiritually the significance here is the day that we are looking God in the face, eye to eye, in defiance, and declaring today our independence from Him, that we will rebuild And we will rebuild with hewn stone. We'll lay a a cornerstone here. But it will not be Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was the cornerstone. Doesn't the Bible say something about He's the chief cornerstone. The one the builders rejected. Hey we were built upon Jesus Christ and Him alone. He was the foundation of this nation. But we began to chip away at it. When it came time to stand up in defiance. We said we'll use our own hewn stone. And guess what? The interesting thing is is that that stone is no longer in place. And I believe again by God's prophecy. It had to be there on display to fulfill prophecy. The sign had to be posted. Every one of these they make a big deal out of. Every single one of these, right? They make a big deal out of this. But let me share something with you. The 20 ton cornerstone of the Freedom Tower was carted off from the World Trade Center. June 23, 2006. Here it is. The 20... Ton cornerstone of the Freedom Tower was carted off from the World Trade Center site early today. Nearly two years after it was ceremonially set in place on July 4th. With its silvered chiseled letters as a tribute to the enduring spirit of freedom. No one made a speech this morning. No one sang God bless America. No one read from the Declaration of Independence. Instead it was quietly placed on a truck and returned to innovative stone. In New York. When he that being the governor. Presided over the laying of this stone two years ago. He declared today we build the freedom tower. As it turns out. Construction could not begin until the cornerstone was removed. One of the contractors. Had noted that. In order for this building, let's see, I'll I'll read it for you. He said, it needs to be repositioned in order to make sense with the new building. In other words, it wouldn't fit into their plans. And again, I think this is just another sign. That one went quietly. That one isn't necessarily fit into the Isaiah 9, 10 prophetic thing. God said, they'll use a hewn stone. But you can try and build what you want to build. But without me, it'll never stand. And God was saying, I will not let you, what you, let me share this scripture, I get excited. 1 Corinthians 3.11, for other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. You can cut this stone, you can bring it there, and you can lay it, and you can have your ceremony, and you can parade it around, and you can boast in your pride and your arrogance, but I'm telling you, there is no other foundation that any man can lay, and Christ Jesus made sure that you won't even have the luxury of laying your hewn stone. You can build it, you can put it in place, but you will build nothing without me. That stone is not in place, but the tower was erected. The chief cornerstone having been rejected. That was just another act of defiance from America. Another sign would be the sign of the sycamore tree. 
The bricks have fallen, but we will rebuild with hewn stone. And they did that. Check, check, check. The sycamores have fallen, but we will replace them with cedar trees. Tom Daschle gets up less than 24 hours and declares this same prophetic word. Not realizing that it would be a sign from God of judgment and grace at the same time. Declaring to the nation, look for every one of these signs. Just in case you haven't read this scripture in the Bible, I'll have your Senate Majority Leader get up and quote it for you so that you will not be able to say we did not know the signs. Sure you did. Here's what Tom Daschle had no idea. You see that stump on the screen. That is what's left. That's the stump of what's known as the miracle tree. The sycamore that stood at St. Paul's. It's interesting. What makes, let me, let me share this. These, these are a couple of. Articles, one's from the New York Times, but it's called the tree of hope that was planted in its place. And by the way, that tree of hope would be a, a cedar tree. It's interesting. St. Paul's Chapel dates back to before the United States Revolutionary War. It is the oldest building in continuous use in Manhattan. It survived the Great Fire of 1777 which was set by the British to punish New Yorkers for their support of the rebels and destroyed most of what was then New York City. But because neighboring residents formed a bucket brigade, they successfully kept the flames from harming St. Paul's Chapel. <laughs> After George Washington was inaugurated a few blocks away at Wall Street, you, you know who George Washington is, right? Our first president. He stopped by St. Paul's to pray. And for more than 250 years, that chapel has served as a place of prayer. Even in the aftermath, it played a central role for the workers to come and, and be refreshed and for them to set up medics and aids. This little chapel, the house of God. Now, uh, let me, as Paul Harvey said, read for you the rest of the story. What makes the story of St. Paul's truly amazing is that by all logic, the, tap, the chapel should not be standing today. It's just a few blocks away from ground zero. On September 11th, more than 2 billion pounds of steel came crashing to the ground. The crash was so powerful, it registered on the Richter scale, where we measure our earthquakes from. Everything inside and below the World Trade Center buildings was smashed beyond recognition. Every window facing trade centers for blocks away was blown out. Every nearby building suffered damage, some beyond repair. The destruction seemed endless. We now know that the total amount, listen to this, the total amount of energy released by the impact of the planes, the explosion of jet fuel, the massive fires burning inside the towers, and finally the collapse equaled the power of a small atomic bomb. This little chapel was a few blocks away from where that all happened. It was not until September 11th that anyone would be able to inspect what was left of St. Paul's. Miraculously, where workers expected to see a pile of rubble, they instead found a completely intact chapel. Not a window had been broken. One was cracked. Not an inch of the walls or the roof had been compromised. The building's structure was as sound as it ever had been before. Inside, there was a six-inch thick layer of dust that coated everything, which did wreck the pipe organ but otherwise nothing was damaged with one notable exception. A giant sycamore that stood at the northwest corner of the graveyard on the spot where the tree of hope now stands. That, the miracle tree stump. And they're going to say, the tree was responsible for saving the church. Before anybody can assess the damage, the 
Senate Majority Leader comes up and reads something that Isaiah had said 700 years before, but he reads it over this nation now and not just over Israel. The bricks have fallen, but we will rebuild with hewn stone. The sycamores have fallen, but we will replace them with cedars. The New York Times, listen to this. For the first time in memory, you can get to the chapel. This is St. Paul's. By way of the gates. The western gates at St. Paul's Chapel on Church Street had been padlocked for no one knows how long. They were reopened on this week. This is November 7, 2003. The open gates allow visitors to approach the chapel as they would have in the 18th century. Reverend Paul Matthews says this, The world does not expect anything like this to exist right in the middle of New York City. And yesterday, the day before this article, was the first time that he had passed through the gates to the chapel. He stopped by as he passed through to study the jagged stump of the sycamore tree that was blown over by the collapse of the World Trade Center. As of the date of this, he says the tree will be replaced this month with a 20-foot Norway spruce, which is a type of conifer tree or cedar tree. I read that because, again, the prophetic implication there that the church was open, but the gates to the church were closed. They have been padlocked for so long, and a mighty blow like this by a few individuals causes the gates of the church to be opened up again and people flood to the church like never before. See, sometimes it takes things like this to awaken us, to open the padlock off of our heart just to be willing to let God in. And I thought, how sad. While, while people have been coming to the church, no one's been able to come through the gate to the church. Why are you saying all that, Pastor? Jesus declared that I'm the gate. He said, He's the gate. You know what the sad truth is? I nearly moved to tears just thinking about it. The sad truth is there are many churches today all around this neighborhood, all over this United States of America. You'll find God preached inside, but the gates are closed. There's no way to Jesus Christ. They don't make room for Him in their service. And the, listen, the church isn't the building. It's you and I. And we have made little room for Christ, even in our own houses of worship. We've padlocked the gate. We can't be out of here by noon, then pastor, I'm going to find me a new church. God bless you. We want to leave the gates open. If God wants to have His way, we want to make sure that He can come in. But the hardness of people's heart, there are many today. And I, I, listen, I know for a fact we've lost people from this church because they've told me and they've told others. He's long-winded. God bless you. you you're going to have trouble in heaven. <laughs> I don't think there'll be breaks for Ryan's. And I don't think there'll be breaks for the football games. I think we're going to be moved. We're going to be moved to be in the presence of the one that gave his life for you and me that, that didn't take a break. So the next sign was the sign of the cedar tree. And I asked in the first service and, and they all seem to be in agreement. But surely I'm not the only one that has enough common sense and logic. If, if the sycamore tree is what stood mightily in its place and took the blow to save the church, then in honor of the sycamore, surely we would plant another sycamore. Is, I mean, is that just, just common sense and logic? So who in their right mind, who in their right mind comes up with the bright idea, let's don't plant a sycamore tree, let's, let's plant a conifer tree, let's, let's plant a spruce. But if this word is prophetic for this nation, then it must come to pass. And even though they don't understand what they're doing or why they're doing it, I mean, I mean it, it, just taking a poll in this church, I have not had one person say, no, oh, Pastor, it makes complete sense to put a cedar tree there. Who wouldn't put a cedar tree? Why, why would you think anything else? 
So as far-fetched as it really is to, to plant anything other than a sick... I mean, after all, it died to save the church. But that it be fulfilled prophetically. A tree of hope, as they called it, was planted in its place. A cedar tree, just like Tom Daschle spoke, and he didn't even know there was a sycamore. And he certainly didn't know that it had been knocked over. And if they had showed up and the chapel was in ruin, nobody would have remembered the sycamore tree. But, but from our nation's foundation, prayer was started there. After our very first president was inaugurated, he comes back to that hollowed ground. What are you getting at? Where it all began. And God preserved the foundation where it all started. If there's ever been a sign, folks, that's the sign. He's pointing it back. He busts the gates of the church wide open and says, you need to get back. You need to get back to Jesus. You need to get back to the foundation of all of this. Let me tell you one more sign regarding that tree of hope. Hope died. The tree died. The tree of hope that they planted there didn't live. Now we live in such a, a day of intelligence and we have some of the sharpest minds in all the world, the most advanced technology in all the world and the sharpest minds dedicated to this great and noble cause. All these wonderful minds could not keep this plant alive, though they tried. I wonder why. Could it, could it be that really God is sovereign? Could it be that God truly is the only one that gives life? Could it be that God is the only one that can allow anything to be planted? And the most powerful and the best sign of all. In the heap of all the rubble and destruction. Two days after 9-11. The searching for bodies and they're frantically digging through all the rubble. And they come across a 20 foot tall cross arising out of the rubble. Two days. Two prophetically, in, in biblical numerology, two is the number of Christ. God the Father, God the Son. Adam was the first man, Christ was the second man. Biblically speaking, in numeric prophecy, biblical prophecy, two is the number of Christ. Two days afterwards, there emerges from the midst of destruction and judgment a sign sticking 20 foot above all the rubble, pointing you back to the only hope, the only answer, the only way that you'll arise. And sadly, while we clap, you want to know what the national response was? The initial response was to get rid of it. Hey, those at 9-11 clamored to it and people knelt down. They prayed to it. They, they left prayers at it. But a group of atheists pushed it all the way up to the Supreme Court, which not too long ago declared that it can remain as a part of the 9-11 history in the museum. Now listen. <laughs> we can cry, God bless America, all we want, but the reality is where were the Christians silencing the voice of the atheist. And the whole thing that blows my mind is why do atheists, these are people that don't believe in God, why do you care about a cross? I understand if the Muslims disagree with it as a religious symbol, but if you don't believe in religion anyway, then why do you care? It's just another thing. So, I, I, I even want to suggest to you that the fact that the Supreme Court upheld it as a an item that will remain in the 9-11 Museum is nothing short of a miracle in and of itself. Can I tell you why? 2,000 years ago, there was a tree. That, that vine. There was a tree that took the blow to save the church, you and me. Isaiah foretold that also in Chapter 53, I believe it is. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. 
He was bruised for our iniquity. Isaiah would foretell that there would come a day where one man would give his life to save the church. And though you look, the church unharmed and undamaged set the crack, excuse me. And the gates open. And when the world wanted to destroy Christianity, the cross remained and God preserved it. For generations and generations, immediately following the crucifixion, the Romans had never cared to hide the cross before this time. But after the resurrection of this one Christ, <laughs> they wanted to forget that it ever happened. They wanted to deny that it ever existed. The world looks at that symbol. Why would they care? It was a Roman torture device. Why would, why in the world would an atheist care about a Roman torture device? It's more than that. It's hope, it's hope, it's hope. It's the blessed hope of all eternity. That cross that rises above destruction and God placed it there for the world to see. And now even the atheist, the unbeliever, the agnostic, the, the Muslim, whoever you are, when you walk through that 9-11 museum, you'll see that cross that God has so faithfully preserved. Stand with me this morning. I want to share this scripture as I close. Just like Noah's ark stood as a daily reminder that the Lord had made a way of escape to whosoever. This cross still stands today as a sign to the world that there's a way of escape. There's hope. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Second Chronicles 7 and 14 says, If my people, if my people which are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Listen to me, church. Judgment begins at the house of the Lord. We can blame this on politicians and we can blame this on the atheists all we want. But it begins at the house of the Lord and that's who God's dealing with. He said, if my people, I'm not looking for 90% of the United States. I'm looking for my people. If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray. Seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I'll heal from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. I want to ask you this morning, find you a spot and pray. Let's pray. Let's pray for ourselves. Let's pray for our nation. Let's pray for our state government. Let's pray for the church this morning. If God's people won't get back to the foundation which is Christ Jesus, if we won't get back to where it all began, there is no hope but God's hand to continue to be outstretched with judgment until the Lord shall return and He is coming, soon coming. Holy Spirit, grip the church. Awaken us, Lord. Stir us again unto revival. Church, please, I beg you, find you a spot to pray. If we have to beg and plead with the church in the service to pray, I wonder how many will pray when we go home. This is, this is why, this is why we're under judgment now. Because God's people scarcely pray.